today. We, we love missions here and we want to uh, continue uh, to do our part in the Great Commission, taking the gospel out to all the world. Now God's called us here in the River Valley to serve and to let our light shine, which we want to do. And Tracy talked all about that stuff in the good news. But you know what? We're to go abroad too. Jesus said to go to Judea, Samaria, to the outermost parts of the world. And we're, gonna, we're taking the gospel out, church. And I'm so excited about missions because uh, for the first time in six years, you know, with, with our Northern New England district, we now have, um, uh, we have BGMC, of course, for the kids, Speed Delight, uh, for the teens, the ladies have the coin fund. And then the men with Light for the Lost is coming back uh, to Maine, really for the first time, or Northern New England District, for the first time in, in, uh, in five or six years since Pastor Lee had came down with cancer and had to go to, to Florida to live uh, just for his own health. And, and uh, we're going to be having the Light for the Lost banquet here for everyone. It's a men's ministry, but everyone's invited. We want to do our part. But it's exciting to see a church love missions. It's exciting when people say, Pastor, I'm so excited. You know, uh, we have missionaries coming and and uh, to look at the, the table, uh, because uh, a lot of churches, missions is going by the wayside um, because of the economy and church decline and all that stuff. But here, we're taking on missionaries. We're believing God to do great things. And I just want to say, before our brother comes, to say a big thank you to this congregation, because you're getting behind a vision that a church without missions is a church that's dead. And, and as we talked about last week with the, the sermon on being a giving church, you know, and, and being like the church of Philippi from Philippians chapter 4. And, you know, maybe you're here today and you're at that place where I, I'm, not, I'm not able to give, as just as the church of Philippi at one point was not, but then God brought them through. The desire, that it's, the thing that you need is a desire to want to be able to get behind missions. And you can get behind missions through your prayer life, and how you serve, and then maybe the financial piece is the last time, or the last part of the puzzle, but, but, but we want to be able to, to give back to God. And I really believe, I really believe that missionaries, in my opinion, are the truest heroes of the faith. When they, when they set aside their families and, and go and serve in a country, you know, and especially, that's not their home country, but some missionaries are home missionaries. But they leave their family to trust God. And some go three or four years. But to give up everything for the cause of Jesus Christ is so amazing and so awesome. <coughs> Praise the Lord. And today we have we have very uh, special family. And it's just you left out here, brother, right? The family is actually the stage left on you up to uh, Children's Church. But, but, uh, but our brother, Patrick... Oh, Lachlan. Praise the Lord. All right. And is, is, is going to come here in a minute and share. And then we're going to take a, a special love offering at the end of the service. You know. But I really have a desire and a vision to see. You know, we've got that wall up there, you know, Phil. But I have a desire as God just moves and blesses for us just to come on down this way. Picking up missionaries to get behind them and to support them not only in prayer and in, you know, fasting, but to get behind and support, you know, financially. If there was ever a time we needed the gospel to go forth and to all of them, and Liz was absolutely correct, everybody needs to know. A little chorus we used to sing back home, everybody ought to know, everybody ought to know, everybody ought to know who Jesus is, everybody. You know, that's a great little course. We can sing that right here. Huh? And, uh, but everybody ought to know, including the people of Ireland. So without further ado, let's give a Western Maine welcome to Patrick O'Reilly, our of Ireland. Praise the Lord. Amen. Praise be to God. Amen. God bless you. Thank you so, thank you so much, everybody. You know, uh, you know, you have a great pastor, a uh, great pastor's amen. wife. Amen. Um, you know, God can do anything if a church has a heart for missions. You know, I pastored in Dudley, Massachusetts. I don't know if anyone even has heard of Dudley, Massachusetts. I had never heard of it before I got there, 
but it was it wasn't a big church. It was uh, you know just uh, wasn't any bigger than this church here. But the Lord helped us to be the biggest missions given church in the Southern New England district uh, for uh, um, uh, we were, uh, district affiliated. And uh, the people just got behind missions. And our, our oldest daughter, Lauren, she's 18, she's with us. And uh, she came to me, and uh, they had a, um, uh, we did Speed of Light. And she came to me, and, uh, you know, she's just a high school student. And she said, uh, you know, God laid it on my heart to give $1,000 to Speed of Light. And I was like, what? You know, where are we going, where are you going to get $1,000, you know? But she said, God told me. And uh, she plays the piano, so she did a couple of piano lessons, and you know, five dollars here, five dollars there. Uh, but you know, the money wasn't coming in. But you know what? When God tells you something and you act on it, God will provide. Amen. And someone called me up and uh, used to be kind of associated with our church, and uh, he told me that my mom died, and uh, could I do the funeral? And uh, I did the funeral for them. Well, she was a woman who pretty much watch TV all day, and she bought everything that was on that shopping channel, right? And so they had to get rid of all this stuff. Okay, so I had a, I said, I'll take it, and we did a yard sale at the church, and we raised over a thousand dollars. Praise God, if God tells you something, do it, amen? amen. Well, it's just, I just want to encourage it, you know, just... Uh, Believe God for great things. Uh, I just want to just, uh, you know, we uh, definitely want to encourage us from the Word of God. Did everybody get a shamrock? Yes. Yes. Okay, that was Ron, right? Ron just, uh, you know, did a great job, Ron. And there he is there, yeah, praise God. Um, and I want to just, uh, you know, use the shamrock a little later to encourage us from the Word of God. But I'll, I'll just take a few minutes and just share my testimony. Um, I uh, come from a, a small Irish family. I'm the oldest of 13 kids. Yeah, I, got, I got eight brothers and four sisters, and I'm, I'm number one. Uh, I, I say a small Irish family because we had neighbors who had 18 kids and another neighbor who had 21 kids. You know, so we weren't, we weren't, uh, we weren't very uh, big compared to some of the other families. And uh, I grew up in an Irish Catholic family about 50 miles south of Dublin. And uh, when I was growing up, you know, I, I really wanted to be a priest. You know, I, I just, uh, I loved the church. I'd been an altar boy. I wanted to serve God. And uh, I went away for a weekend, and I was going to make a decision whether I was going to be a priest or not. Well, uh, I read the small print, right? You know, you can't get married, right? So I was like, well, I'm not going to be a priest <laughs> if I can't get married. And instead, I went to a business college in Ireland. And I graduated from a business college in Ireland with a degree in gambling. I ended up with a, a gambling addiction, which is a big, big problem in Ireland. And uh, I ended up depressed, obviously, with the addiction. And uh, my dad gave me the mortgage payment to pay the bank one day, and I lost the gambling. And so I ended up uh, being suicidal. And I just thought the only thing I could do was just take my life because there was no hope. All my money, all my time was being consumed with my gambling addiction. But I did the thing that saved my life. And I hope everybody else has done this here. I went into our local Catholic church and I was in the back pew and I called out to God. I said, God, if you're real, save me. And the scriptures say that those who call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Amen. And even though I didn't know a Bible verse, even though I didn't know a born-again Christian, you'd think, well, you don't know a born-again Christian in Ireland? Well, the statistics in Ireland is, of a population of 6.3 million people, there's only 100,000 that are born again. So there's 6.2 million people in Ireland that don't have a relationship with the Lord. They might know about the Lord, but that's not enough, right? You, you have to know the Lord, right? And so I didn't know anyone who was born again. I didn't know anyone who could tell me how to be saved. But I called out to God. And when I called out to God, God miraculously worked in my life through a ministry called the Covenant Players. I'm not sure if you're familiar with the Covenant Players. They're an interdenominational drama ministry. 
that originally based in Los Angeles, but went over to Europe with the American military, worked with the chaplaincy program. And so uh, I, God, when he heard that prayer, when God hears a prayer, he goes to work, amen? amen. And so what God did is, is he miraculously brought me in contact with this Christian drama ministry called the Covenant Players. And what happened was, I was, uh, you know, I prayed that prayer, but nobody shared the scripture with me. Nobody told me, uh, you know, you prayed the prayer of salvation. No, nobody told me that. And so, obviously, God had to bring Christians into my life. And he, um, he allowed a situation where I was living at a Jesuit retreat house. Now, I wasn't there for religious reasons, but uh, when I was growing up in the 80s in Ireland, there was no work in Ireland. And the unemployment rate was so high that the Jesuits approached the government and said, we'd like to take 12 young people, have them come live at the house, and we'd like to teach them how to work with unemployed groups. And so I was one of those 12. And this Irish team of the Covenant Players, Interdenominational Drama Ministry, called the Jesuit house and said, our housing fell through. Can we come and stay at the house tonight? I want to encourage us that our disappointments are often God's appointments, right? Because of that disappointment, I was able to have an appointment with God. And they came and they stayed at a house and did, did some Christian plays the next morning. And I really heard the gospel for the first time. And they gave me uh, information. And uh, a year later... I was working for 7-Eleven in Ireland, so it's like an American theme here, you know. And uh, but you know, it was I was living in Dublin, and it was I was living on the north side, and the store was on the south side. I walked one hour to work every day. It was a 24-hour store. I was walking through the streets of Dublin, one o'clock, two o'clock in the morning, just walking home, and it was just it wasn't really a safe thing. And I called out to God. I said, God, there's got to be a purpose to life. And God spoke to me and said, I want you to join the Covenant Players. And so I, I, you know, I go looking for the brochure that they gave me a year previously, and I can't find it. I'm like, what am I going to do? I open a book, and the brochure falls out onto the ground. <laughs> I want to just say that when God, God is able to keep something that he knows that he will use later to bring you to salvation. So I want to encourage you, when you give a tract to someone, and they put it in their pocket, don't think that's the end. Because God is able to bring that track back to their remembrance. And it could be years later. And God did a wonderful thing because the team happened to be in Dublin at that time. And so within a week I had an interview. And I sat down with the team and uh, they asked me a couple of questions. Now, they asked me if I was a Christian because it's a Christian drama ministry. Well, I have been raised Catholic. I, I knew about the Lord. I didn't know the Lord. So I said, well, of course I'm a Christian. Right? Because if you ask most people in America, Europe, I'm sure they're a Christian. I wasn't a Christian, but I thought I was. And uh, the second thing they asked me is, can you give a two-year commitment? And I said, sure. Then the third thing they asked me was, do you have a Bible? Well, I didn't have a Bible, but I said, I think I could borrow one. So I borrow a Bible, and I take a, uh, I take a, a, a boat to uh, the port of Dublin, I take a, a, a boat to, uh, I'm sorry, I take a train to Dublin, the port, I take a, a boat to uh, England, I take a train to Dover, I take a boat to Belgium, I take a train to Stuttgart, Germany, to dr join this Covenant Player Drama Ministry. Well, of course, when I show up, I realize there's something different about them, right? Because they know the Lord and I don't, <laughs> right? And, uh, and so uh, they asked me, uh, just to get to know me, what my favorite Bible verse was. Now, I didn't know a Bible verse. I didn't know John 3.16. I knew no Bible verse. So I had to say something. So I quoted from Jonathan Livington Siegel. Now, you know, that's not in the Bible. And so they were like, who is this guy and what's he doing here? And uh, then they said, okay, here's some scripts we want you to, uh, you know, I want you to learn these plays. I'm like, I don't get up in front of people. I, I, I can build sets and I can do these things backstage, but I don't get up in front of people. And they were like, what are you talking about? This is what we do full time. You have to get up in front of people and perform. Well, I don't know about you, but uh, 
you know, some people would rather be in the coffin than give the eulogy at a funeral, right? And I was one of those people. I would be terrified to get up in front of the, any crowd, and I would ruin the play. And so people in the team I was on were actually praying me out. They were like, we need to get rid of this guy because he's not doing the right thing here with the plays. But you know what? God had called me. And God, had, God spoke to me out of John chapter 6, where Jesus gives a difficult teaching, and uh, everybody leaves him. And he turns to the twelve, and he says, are you going to leave me too? And Peter said, well, where will we go? You alone have the words of eternal life. And those words just jumped off the page. I said, well, you know, I accepted Jesus as my Savior. I have a terrible fear of getting up in front of people, but I'm going to keep my word. You know, sometimes it's just a matter of being faithful in the small things. Well, God has a sense of humor, doesn't he? Because each team covers a geographical area. And so each team goes out for four months. And so my second tour, they put me on the Italian team. I don't speak a word of Italian. So I had to memorize the lines in Italian and hope they came out. So that's where I got all my gray hair. And that's where David and Goliath became so real to me. That, uh, you know, to get up in another language and just trust God. But I want to just encourage us. God is faithful. And God will never leave us or forsake us. Whatever he calls us to do, he will give us the ability to do it. Amen? Amen. And so I say all that to, to say that God has called me back to Ireland uh, as a missionary. And I'm actually going back to my hometown. I'm going to be uh, helping the Assembly God Church in my hometown, about uh, 50 miles south of Dublin. The uh, work in Ireland is, uh, is so needed. Uh, you know, just to give you some uh, numbers, there's about 30 Assembly God Churches in the entire country. And so in many, many parts of Ireland, there is no evangelical witness whatsoever. And so the Assemblies of God are hoping to plant in the next two years another 15 churches. And so we're just excited about being a part of that. And uh, because one of the things about being Irish is obviously, you know, uh, I can relate to Irish people. Right? I can, I can tell what the Lord has done in my life. And what he can do in their life as well. Because, you know, Jesus, the Bible says, he came to that which was his own. Amen? And so, you know, there's something that just about being your own. That you can... Tell people what the Lord has done in your life. So we're excited. We hope to, you know, be there next August and uh, begin working at the church. We're itinerating full-time now, and uh, our, our kids are going to go to school there. And we're, you know, because uh, I'll say one more thing before we look into the Word. You know, God is incredible that everything that happens in our life, He uses to shape us for what He wants us to be. And I think if you want to minister in Europe, the best preparation you can have is to minister in New England. Because if you can survive New England, you can survive anywhere, right? Praise God. And I pastored for 14 and a half years in Dudley, Massachusetts. And there's just some things that they don't teach you in Bible school that you have to learn uh, on the job. So we're excited about going back. Because it's all about relationships, isn't it? It's about one person at a time. But I want to just encourage us in the Word of God. And uh, I, I, oh, everybody got a shamrock. And uh, I'd like you to turn in your Bibles, if you have your Bibles with you, to uh, Mark chapter um, 2. And uh, I want to look at this passage of Scripture uh, where Jesus heals the paralytic. And uh, everybody got a shamrock. And so, um, you know, tradition tells us that... Um, when uh, St. Patrick brought Christianity to Ireland, he uh, was explaining the Trinity, okay, the Father, Son, the Holy Spirit, that there's uh, one God but three persons, right? And uh, the Irish couldn't understand that. Like, most people probably couldn't understand that. How could there be only one God uh, but three persons? Well, he picked up a shamrock, and he used the shamrock to explain the Trinity. He said, look, one flower, three leaves. Okay? One God, three persons. And so what I wanted to do is, I'd like you to write a couple of things on the shamrock. I'll give you what to write. So you can take this home, and hopefully it will minister to you. Now you can look at this, you know, if you want to look at it every day, 
and uh, what we're going to share about today that it will just bless your life. So um, we're going to uh, look at the passage of scripture uh, in Mark chapter two. Now I'm going to read from the NIV because uh, when I grew up, obviously I didn't have a Bible, and when someone gave me a Bible, they gave me an NIV, and they said the NIV stands for the Northern Ireland version. <laughs> so I thought, wow, Ireland's got its own version. So I, I just like the NIV, and so. Um, but let's uh, let's look at this passage of scripture. A few days later, reading uh, chapter two, verse one to twelve. A few days later, when Jesus again entered Capernaum, the people heard that he had come home. So many gathered that there was no room left not even outside the door, and he preached the word to them. And since they could not get him to Jesus because of the crowd, I'm oh, sorry, some men came bringing, him to a, bringing to him a paralytic carried by four of them. And since they could not get him to Jesus because of the crowd, they made an opening in the roof above Jesus, and after digging through it, lowered the mat the paralyzed man was lying on. And when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven. Now some teachers of the law were sitting there, thinking to themselves, Why does this fellow talk like that? He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? Immediately Jesus knew in his spirit that this is what they were thinking in their hearts, and he said to them, Why are you thinking these things? Which is easier to say to the paralytic, Your sins are forgiven, or to say, Get up, take your mat, and walk? But that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. He said to the paralytic, I tell you, get up, take your mat, and go home. He got up, took his mat, and walked out in full view of them all. And this amazed everyone. And they praised God, saying, we have never seen anything like this. We have never seen anything like this. How many of us would like to see things that we never saw before, right? Right? We don't like to go back to the same places and see the same things. Amen. We want to see new things, right? And so it says here, we have never seen anything like this before. And that's, that's the vision of the church. Amen. That God show us new things. Help us to see things we've never seen before. Well, I want you to see here that before we see things that we've never seen before, Jesus has to see something in us. All right? Because it says, when he saw their faith, right? When he saw their faith, the miracles happened. When he saw their faith, the man was forgiven and the man was healed. And so in order for us to see the miracles of God, God has to see something in us. And it says here it's faith, right? Okay, he has to see the faith that's necessary in us. So here's what I want to do. I, I want to kind of uh, just help us to just take an inventory of our life uh, to, uh, to kind of see if we have what God wants to see. And so I want you to take the shamrock, if you, if you can get it. If you have a pen, that would be great. But if you don't have a pen, you have a pen, okay? I want you to... I want you to write this phrase on the front of the shamrock, right? Okay, I want you to write this phrase on the front of the shamrock. All right? Okay? If you don't have a pen, then hopefully you can remember that. Okay, it's a question. And I want you to imagine that you came in this morning, and uh, Ron, right? Ron's over here, right? And Ron gave you your bulletin, and he asked you this question. And I want you to write it on the shamrock, on the front of the shamrock. This question, why am I here today? Why am I here today? Imagine someone uh, asked you that this morning. Why am I here today? Okay. Well, many of us will say it was none of your business, but, uh, you know, but, uh, but it's a, I think it's a great question. Why am I here today? And, you know, I, I get, you know, just pastor, he, he was encouraging us why we're here today, right? Why we should be here today. Because I want to look at this passage of Scripture. And I want to show you from this passage of Scripture 
that that crowd that were there today, the crowd that uh, couldn't contain, that the building couldn't contain, that in that crowd were three groups of people. And each of those three groups were there for a different reason. And as we look at this passage, passage of Scripture, I want to really ask us to ask the Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, which of these three reasons identifies me? And obviously there's going to be one that God wants us to be here for. Okay, so let's look at this passage of Scripture. Okay, so obviously huge crowd, can't get anybody else in. Why are they there that day? Well, I want you to, so I'm going to give you three words that now to write in the back of the shamrock, right? One in each leaf, and it, it's going to be one of us. One of these words is going to be us, all right? And so I want you to, I want you to, so you're going to pick a leaf and you're going to write a word in each leaf. All right, everybody understand? I'm sorry if I'm confusing everybody. Okay, I want you to write this word. So why am I here today? I want you to write on the other side one word and one of the leaves. Duty. D-U-T-Y. Duty. Okay. Duty. D-U-T-Y. All right. Sorry about the accent there. D-U-T-Y. All right. What do we mean? Well, if you look at this passage of Scripture, there's a group of people at this service, and they're teachers of the law. Okay. And they're... There, and the Bible says that they're sitting, and as Jesus tells the man, his sins are forgiven, they are critically thinking, who does this fellow think he is? Who can forgive sins but God alone? And so I want to just mention to us that those teachers of the law are in that meeting out of duty. They don't really want to be there. But somebody said, you got to go check this Jesus out. you got to see who he is. We know you don't really want to be there. We know that he might say things you don't like. He might do things you don't like. But you need to be there. And when a person is in church and they don't really want to be there, they're just doing it out of duty. All right? Is that how a lot of us grew up? Right? Didn't really want to be there, but we had to go. Now... I want to just say something straight off. There's a good duty, right? Because sometimes we don't feel like, we, now we don't have to raise our hands, right? But sometimes we don't always feel like we want to be in church. Maybe we're not feeling well, maybe we're tired, you know what? Uh, and uh, instead of staying at home, we come. That's a good duty. And then when we come, we participate. That's, that's good duty. Uh, I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about when we don't want to be there, and we make it obvious we don't want to be there. Now, it might be not obvious to you, but it's usually obvious to the pastor uh, who's, uh, who preaches, right? Now, these are two red flags when we're just coming to a service out of duty. I want you to notice two things about these teachers of the law. First of all, it says that they're sitting there. That's a red flag right there. When all I'm going to do is come to church, and I'm going to sit, and I'm not going to participate, right? I'm going to sit, I'm going to soak, and I'm going to sour, right? That's, 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 that's duty, okay? The second thing we see here is not only are they sitting, but it says that they are thinking critically. They're upset about Jesus, all right? And when we're just doing something out of duty, when we don't really want to be there, What's going to happen is the devil is going to give us these critical thoughts, right? He's just going to be giving us thoughts that are critical about everything that's going on. Oh, you know, the worship is too long, or, or the pastor's too long, or, or uh, uh, you know, you're not enjoying it, right? Right? And so, you know, and Jesus rebukes them, right, for being there out of duty. He said, that's, that's not... Why you should be there. Now, I, I pastored, you know, obviously, like you're a pastor. And uh, I, I remember one time, um, we used to have a, uh, a lunch once a month after church. 
right? And we would get all the tables and we would, uh, you know, put the chairs around them and people would bring food and we would eat. Well, uh, one particular uh, month, uh, I said to one of the older gentlemen, uh, listen, I'd like this month if we could put the tables together so we could be more family. Well, previous months, we used to keep the tables apart. Well, he got up so upset that he went out and he stayed in his car and would not come in and eat with us. Okay. That's duty, right? That's not what God wants. God does not want duty. That kind of duty. So, let's, let's be careful, you know, that Lord... Don't let me just show up just out of duty. You know. Now we have uh, a second group of people I want to share with you. Now, this is the, um, the bigger of the three groups, right? Um, this is the, uh, you know, it says that he heard, they heard that he had come home and they packed the house out. All right? And, um, and so, why are they there that day? Why, why, are, why is this second group here? Well, I want to give you another word. Devotion. Okay, D-E-V-O-T-I-O-N. Okay, they're, they're there out of devotion. They love Jesus. They hear Jesus has come home, and so they, they, they packed the, the pack, the pack the meeting, right? They, they packed the meeting. And, um, you know, uh, and they follow Jesus around. Okay, he's uh, in Capernaum tonight. And he's going to be in Nazareth next week, and we're going to be there, and we're going to be at that meeting, right? And, uh, and it says that when he saw the crowd, he preached a word to them. And so, they're there out of, out of devotion. They love Jesus, just like we love Jesus. They want to hear preach, Jesus preach, just like we want to hear preach, Jesus preach. Jesus opened the word. We want Jesus to open the word. The problem with devotion is, that's often where we cap it. Okay, we've arrived at devotion. And so, we're devoted to Jesus. So, we love Jesus. And so, I've arrived. I'm, 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 I've made it. I'm devoted to Jesus. But the problem is this third group that show up. And uh, we know it was uh, four men that bring this paralytic to Jesus. And they can't get in because of the crowd. And so they get up on the roof, they make an opening in the roof, they dig through and they lower the man in front of Jesus, right? And it says, when Jesus saw their faith, he said, your sins are forgiven. He never said anything to the other people that were there out of devotion. So this is really where we're getting at here. Why are these people there? And what is so special about them? I believe that they were there out of desperation, right? They were there out of desperation. And see, what happens is the church settles for devotion, but God wants us to be desperate. And what, what happens is, when, I speak for myself, but don't we find the Lord out of desperation? Right. Sometimes we have to get, people can share the Lord with us day in, day out, and we just let it go. But when we get to that place of desperation, then we call out to God. But here's the problem. Sometimes, you know, we find the Lord in desperation, but then we backslide to devotion. Right? And even worse, sometimes we even backslide to duty. When God always wants us to be desperate. Because it says that when he sees our desperation, then we'll see his miracles. So, I want to just encourage us, you know, from this passage of scripture, you know, how do we show God our desperation? Okay, and I think there's two things that we see here. First, well, a couple of things we see. First of all, desperate people don't give up. Right? Right? Everybody else that was devoted or uh, had their out of duty, when they showed up late and they saw that they couldn't get in, they all went home, right? 
but the desperate didn't. They found a way to get to Jesus. And what they did is they climbed up on the roof, right? And they did two things that I want to just share about what desperate people do. First of all, it says that they made an opening in the roof. All right? In other words, what that communicates to me is that desperate people are people who open themselves to the Lord. I mean, they're open to new things. They're open to new opportunities. Uh, they, they don't put God in a box and say, Okay, God, uh, Sunday morning, 10 to 12, that's your only time to do anything. And uh, everything else is... Forget about it. You know, desperate people are open to the Lord. They're open to new things. They're, they're open to, uh, you know, just being available to God. Didn't Jesus say to the church in Revelation, it says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock, and if anyone opens the door, now here's my voice, and opens the door, I will come in and I will sup with him and him with me. That's not to a sinner. That's to the church. In other words, what the church had done is it had no longer allowed itself to be open to the Lord. Amen? And so, uh, you know, just... To encourage you to get by your pastor and his wife, you know, as the Lord shows him new things to do. Be open. Amen. Be open to new ways of reaching people. Uh, be open to new opportunities to grow in the things of God, in, in your ministry, in, in, your, in your knowledge of the Lord. Be open. Just say, never say, oh, I've arrived. Okay, I know it all. You know. And we have a terrible habit in Ireland. When you talk to somebody in Ireland, and you, you tell them something, they always respond, I know. It drives me crazy, I know. No, you don't know. I just, but they say that just to kind of get an out, you know. And so we got to be open, right? we got to be open. Then the second thing we see that they do is when they open an opening in the roof, the Bible says to do a second thing. It says they dug through. They dug through and put the man in front of Jesus. In other words, what we have to do, not only to be open, but we have to be diggers, right? Okay, the Bible says that the kingdom of God is like treasure buried in a field. Okay? When a man finds it, well, the question I want to ask is, how did he find it if it was buried? He was digging, amen? And the, and the, the great, the, the miracles... And the great things of God are not on the surface. They're only for desperate people who will dig. Amen? They're only for desperate people who will go farther. Jesus said, you know, you got to seek me with all your heart. Amen? we got to dig. And we have to dig for ourselves. Amen? Right? What did the Berean church do? After Paul preached, they went home and they, and they got into the Word to see what he said was right. Amen? We've we got we to dig. We've got to dig into the Word. We've got to dig into prayer. We've got to dig into outreach. We've got to dig, dig so that we can get the jewels of what God wants for us. Desperate people. And when God sees a desperate people being desperate for Him, then nothing can stop him from pouring out his spirit. Amen. So here's the question I want to just leave us. Why am I here today? Did I come out of duty? It's Sunday morning and, you know, if I'm not in church, someone might notice and call me and, and uh, I really don't want to be here. Uh, maybe I don't know the Lord as my Savior and I'm just here out of duty. Well, that's not a good reason to be here. And if it is the reason we're here, we're never going to get anything from the Lord. Or maybe we're here out of devotion. We love God. And you know, we love to sing the songs. We love to hear the sermon. That's wonderful. It's wonderful to be devoted to Jesus. But you know what? It's not enough. We have to be desperate. We have to say, Jesus... I, I can't live without you. I can't make it without you. 
I'm opening myself to you. And maybe you're here today and maybe you, you don't know the Lord and, and you're in that desperate situation of just trying to do it all yourself. Well, God is here today to save you. And God is saying, if you get desperate with me, I'll get desperate for you. You know, I, you know have we hit a wall? Have we backslid into devotion? Well, I believe today the Lord would say, okay, let's get desperate again. Let's say, Lord, I'm just going to open myself to you and I'm going to, I'm going to just dig into you, into my relationship with you. Let me, let's pray. Let's ask the Lord to, Lord, I, I just want to thank you, Lord, for the wonderful people here, God, of Praise Assembly, God. God, I thank you for Pastor and his wife Mary and Lord, I thank you for the light, God, that is in this valley. And Lord God, as he's preaching, God, desperation, God. Lord God, that you will do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that they could ever ask or imagine, God. I pray if there's anybody here today, God, who doesn't know you as their Savior, God, that are here out of duty, God, or here out of devotion, God. But Lord God, have never been desperate, God, for salvation, God, that you would touch them today, God. God, I thank you, Lord. God, for... God, the fact that, Lord, Lord, it, you see where we are with you. And, Lord, we repent today, God. We repent, God, of anything that's not desperation, God. Lord, we just repent. And, Lord, you are a God who forgives and restores, God. And we thank you. And we ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you. You know, church, we've been challenged. Amen. And Jesus, when he challenged folks, he challenged folks publicly. Three D's. Duty, <coughs> devotion, and desperate. And we know that God is a God of the present. In this room right now are Sixth graders and older. And it's a deep question. Why am I here? Just as Mordecai told Esther for such a time as this, we have been called. But before one becomes desperate for the Lord, and to believe, they have to know. The Bible says now, today is a day of salvation. You could be a ministry team member, a Sunday school teacher, a member of the church, visitor, but not truly know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior of your life. Maybe you're here and you've gone astray. Maybe at one time you were desperate, but now it's duty. Or perhaps devoted. We love to sing this little song, Breathe. 